Welcome, a very, very warm welcome um, tonight and uh, thank you very much uh, for coming um, to attend this uh, professorial platform, uh, which is the last one in uh, the series for this academic year. Um, I will be entertaining you tonight uh, with hopefully some very smooth technologies going on here. Um, what I want to talk to you about is very much about the core of my research practice, designing for the biocentury and really looking into the intersection of design and biology. Um, but I want to take you through a bit of a journey. Um, it so happens I've actually started working at Central St. Martins back in November uh, 1997, not quite 20 years, but nearly. And what I want to do is celebrate uh, my journey, how I have actually uh, grown my research, um, and I want to start by reading a quote which really resonates which, with, with my practice. Uh, this is from Tim Ingold, um, who's an anthropologist, um, who says, practitioners I content are wanderers, wayfarers, whose skills lie in their ability to find a grain of the world's becoming and to follow its course while bending it to their evolving purpose. I contend I am a wanderer and I am a wayfarer um, and I very much um, kind of try and find my convoluted ways through various uh, research practice. Seeking knowledge, wandering, learning and experimenting is actually what I do. You will have received one of these, I hope, when you came in. Um, you may have wondered why they look so um, chaotic. <laughs> this is the publication uh, for tonight. I wanted to collate fragments of my research. Um, I wanted you to find your own way into my research by just picking what you feel is right in terms of the starting point. For me, design research is not a linear practice. Uh, it's an interconnected series of experiments, questions, hypotheses that we manifest through shapes and forms, speculations, provocations. I really wanted to um, invite you to share this, this chaos with me but also to understand that for me, each research question that has led one of my projects has also led to another research question. Each design proposition has opened up new interrogations, each publication, each exhibition has led to a new set of encounters. Every bit of new knowledge echoes a previous one and resonates with the next. And this is what I want to take you through um, this evening. So first of all, why? Why do I do what I do? I'm formally trained as a textile designer. Um, a textile designer is very much concerned with the, what I call the textility and the materiality of the everyday. Often overlooked, textiles is all around us. Um, and this is how I began my research journey. Quite a few people actually do not know this, but I originally came to Central St. Martins back in 1991 uh, to do my master's studies here. The reason why I came is because after completing my BA studies in Paris in textiles, um, I felt there was a real issue for me to continue working for a very toxic industry. The textile industry is very toxic. Um, and I wanted to see whether we could reconcile principles of ecology together with principles of design. Sustainability has been a key driver all along. Um, as you can see here, and you can find many different kinds of uh, data and statistics, um, but textiles is fourth in a ranking of product category which causes the greatest environmental impact just after food, drinks, transport and housing. Being a designer working for, the, for this industry, uh, was problematic for me, and I wanted to find new ways to design and manufacture. This is one of the two depressing slides tonight, I promise. <laughs> um, but, you know, an important fact to know, it, it's not just sort of vague concerns. The industry that launched the Industrial Revolution has long illustrated some of its most notorious design failures. About one half of the world's wastewater problems are linked to the production of textile goods. One half of the world's wastewater problems. So we really have a lot to answer for when we are designers uh, working for the textile industry. 
Biomimicry, um, I came across uh, Janine Benius back in 1997. Uh, Benius is a, is a biologist. Um, and I felt the way she talked about biology, the way she wrote about it, really um, could become an inc incredibly powerful tool to embed ecological principles in design. So biomimicry really is the emulation of nature. So looking into what can we learn from how nature operates. Uh, here's a quote from her, life can't put its factory in the edge of town, it has to live where it works. As a result, nature's first trick of the trade is that nature manufactures its materials under life-friendly conditions in water, at room temperature, without harsh chemicals or high pressures. We actually don't know how to do this. As a, as a species, as human, uh, tend to go for um, high energy, um, high levels of chemicals involved in our manufacturing processes. Yet if you look at you know, a tree and its ecosystem, um, the waste of a tree becomes a nutrient um, of another species. How can we import these principles in design? So looking into new models for, bio above for biofabrication uh, in the context of the Anthropocene era, transitioning towards design and production models that mimic nature's model, cyclic local solar. I was born in the 20th century. I was trained in the 20th century, um, which was still very much the inheritance of the Industrial Re Revolution, for which textile has been uh, absolutely key. But Benius talks about the heat, beat, and treat approach. So we will extract raw material, we will heat it, we'll beat it, uh, we'll use uh, petrochemicals. Um, this is very much uh, the, the operating system of the 20th century. And it's also designed in a way that we sort of take natural resources as for granted, as if they were limitless. Um, traditionally, textile mills were located next to a river so that uh, they could in, you know, get the water but also reject dirty water straight into the river streams. Um, this mentality is slowly shifting to a, 20th, a 21st century model which is much more looking into a biological revolution where manufacturing is becoming boring. The focus is much more on biology, high-tech biology or synthetic biology where perhaps in the 21st century what is limitless is technology, not nature. The bioeconomy as a context for design, uh, this is very much the field uh, I locate my practice within. The OECD defines the bioeconomy as referring to the set of economic activities relating to the invention, development, production, and use of biological products and processes. The bioeconomy, as you know it, is very much agriculture, looking at how we can extract biomass and exploit biomass to derive and produce uh, a whole range of artifacts and products. But what is changing is with synthetic biology, um, there's a whole new dimension of uh, the bioeconomy, uh, which is now perceived to be one of the largest employers in the EU. I know we're living in the EU, but I still think we need to look at what's going on on the other side. Um, the uprising of synthetic biology, another key driver for me, because biology is in the midst of becoming the new digital. Um, synthetic biology has many definitions, actually. You'll find quite a few if you look it up. But the Royal Society defines it as um, a biology that involves the design and constructions of novel artificial biological pathways, organisms, devices, or the redesign of existing natural biological systems. Effectively, we can now design a new species on a computer, we can design its genome, we can print the DNA, we can boot it up in a cell, and we can create an organism that has never existed on the planet before. And we can tailor this organism to produce bespoke substances that could be useful for us, but this, by doing so, relying on biological principles of um, producing at local level with very few um, elements and with very little energy. In 2012, uh, George Osborne, the then chancellor, declared that synthetic biology was one of the eight key technology that the government would invest in. Um, and it's predicted to become a 10 billion economy by 2018. It 
probably a bit more now, actually. So these are my key drivers, sustainability, textiles, materiality, uh, biomimicry, looking into ecosystem, inter interconnecting, um, interconnected ecosystems, synthetic biology, biology, botany. How do I do what I do? Sometimes I do wonder, actually. <laughs> but what I wanted to show you today is a few examples of how I've gone about developing my practice. Uh, how do I interconnect research, learning, curriculum to grow alternative sustainable strategies? For me, teaching and research are completely uh, symbiotic. We need both. Uh, one informs the other. And one of the very first things I did um, when I started working here was starting to think about, well, what is actually textile design? How do we teach it? How do we learn about it? And how can we break away from this notion that textile is about print, knit and weave? Um, and I went about slowly shaping uh, what I call a disobedient curriculum, looking into disrupting the textile design protocol, looking into designing for a future that embraces ecological productions, explores smart technologies, looks into globalization, climate change, social innovation. This demands a very different approach uh, to designing textiles, and I won't explain all the projects here tonight, but I think what is interesting is that a lot of the, uh, key stu the students and alumni from this course have really gone into industry now uh, to shift and change the world into you know, um, Citroën, Adidas, Nike, uh, setting up their own practice. But they all developed their own voice, their own way to design textiles. So from Helena, that you can see in the middle, looking into combining um, vintage textiles with, at the time, what was at the time some of the first flexible uh, solar photovoltaic panels. To Céline, who is now at Citroën, who's actually looked into embedding electroluminescent technologies um, as a way to indicate our energy consumption. And this was 10 years ago, way before we talked about smart meters. Uh, to looking into rethinking craft, biomimicry, to, how, to looking into how we integrate biological principles uh, in the curriculum. So we did various projects through uh, working with Microsoft, uh, looking into um, working with shape memory alloys to mimic uh, the pine cone behavior. What you can see on the film behind me is Ellen Eng who um, worked with shape memory alloys, shape memory films, and shape memory fibers to look at developing a series of responsive um, architectural textiles. Exploring how do we shift from working with animate matter to inanimate matter? What does that tell us? How do we start to shift our way of thinking and how do we shift our imaginary of future technologies? So moving on from really rethinking our textile practice, how we can use textiles as a tool for research and as a research system. Um, and very much after having worked with um, biological tools, and I'll explain, I'll show some of these projects, I really wanted to set up a, what I call a rambunctious lab because it's got a life of its own. Um, it's sometimes very, very dynamic and sometimes goes dormant. Um, but the Design and Living Systems Lab um, is really designed to explore the interface of biological sciences and, and design to challenge established paradigms and propose new sustainable materials and forms of production for the future. Really looking at what can we do when we intersect biology and design, and how can I help us address some of our sustainable challenges? So this lab is very much based on principles of biomimicry and on how can we understand what I call the biological advantage. And I talk about the biological advantage in relation to our industrial manufacturing system. What is better about a biology fabrication than about an industrial fabrication? 
So an example, and this is based from a research uh, produced by Yale University back in 2013, looking into how many elements do we actually use in the production of an iPhone. I won't read all of them, but there's quite a few, as you can see. Um, of the 83 stable elements in the periodic table, a total of 62 different types of metal go into making the average mobile handsets. 62 elements from the periodic table. From that research, from that study, they identified actually 12 of them had no foreseeable possible replacement. Yet, there's a limit to how much of these elements we can actually get. There's currently, there's a list of endangered elements. We talk about endangered species. Um, but in the US, they publish a list of endangered elements. So that manufacturing um, agencies can actually start looking into where well, we won't have that much of this particular rare earth very soon, so what else can we use instead? But it's still very much that mindset of, you know, keep hacking the planet, keep actually mining the planet without thinking about how can we think about a much more renewable ecological system in the way we produce. If you compare to a biological system, take a tree, all what the tree will need to fabricate its bark, its trunk, its branches, its leaves, it's roughly six elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Of course, produced locally at ambient temperature without the logistics that we need for our very much loved iPhone, uh, where once all the mining is produced, it's got to be shipped um, in on manufacturing sites, which have then got to be distributed around the globe. So. This is what I talk about the biological system. It's using very little elements at ambient temperature produced locally. So thinking about this biological advantage, how does nature make a textile? What you're actually looking at is um, lace bark. It's produced by a tree, the Lagetta Lagetto tree, which is in Jamaica. Um, but if I hadn't said this, you probably would have assumed, oh, well, this is just a piece of glass. This is something we've handwoven, or this is something we've made. No, it's grown on a tree at ambient temperature, produced using local elements. Um, so how come nature can fabricate such um, complex materials that when we fabricate them, we generate a whole range of toxic behaviors? You may be more familiar with the coconut bark, but here's another example of a bark um, that is a bit more coarse and a bit more rigid than the lace bark, uh, but actually very much looks like a woven cloth. Which means there's a set of genes in nature, there's a set of codes in nature that actually say weave. So maybe we can actually learn from that. The Venus flower basket uh, is a sea sponge. It's actually qualified as, a, as an animal. Uh, grows at the bottom of our oceans um, and grows very slowly by turning traces of silica found in water into glass-like structures. This looks like, I mean, this could look like a 3D printed uh, artifact, uh, but it actually has grown again at ambient temperatures. And if you look closely, at the bottom um, of that sea sponge, you can see a lot of um, hair-like, they actually are quite soft, uh, but they are again made of this glass-like material. The properties of these uh, fibers, uh, they have optical properties far superior to any optical fiber we can currently produce industrially. So optical fiber grown at the bottom of our ocean, that sea sponge, can work better than we do. Again, can work, what can we learn from that? And how can we biologize a design brief? So one of the things I think we're not doing enough is actually taking time to observe nature and to really understand what happens. Uh, I'm going to show just a few examples here. Um, I'm a, a bit of an amateur botanist and I'm very interested in gardening. And what you can see here uh, are examples which I find fascinating. A leaf that is actually creating a tie-dye effect. Um, tie-dye is something that we 
uh, do very much in textiles, but this is a leaf producing a color change. Um, a flower which actually creates a whole range of textures, and this actually feels like paper, uh, but this is out of one seed. You know, cells have multiplied and developed to go and find a particular purpose and function and to become a particular material, again using the six elements I mentioned. And at seed pod that you can see above me, this is a seed pod itself, and you can see how it's, it's engineered in a very complex fashion uh, with those of different textures and which each of the seed, the seed um, have a range of fibers so that when the, when the seed explodes, they actually can go and fly off with the wind. This is again all done with just simple cell differentiation slowly growing into their final function. So how do we observe nature, how do we learn from nature, and how do we begin to translate these principles and to import these principles into designing, and into textiles in my case. So my very first trial was for a project called Nobel Textiles, um, which was uh, an incredibly, um, um, it was an incredible privilege to work on this project. This was thanks to Professor Amanda Fisher, who um, is a director of the Medical Research Council Clinical Sciences Center, who came up with the idea of pairing together a Nobel laureate together with a textile scientist. Her rationale was that in biology, uh, there's quite a, a lot of use of a textile language. So you talk about a DNA thread, you talk about folding proteins, you talk about unzipping a cell. And she saw there was an interesting parallel between a textile language and biology and wanted to experiment, so this was a massive experiment. Um, what happens when you put a Nobel laureate and textile designer together? And you can um, see how difficult it is <laughs> to think through. Uh, so I um, was paired up with uh, Sir John Sulston, uh, who is known in the UK for having been leading the decoding of the human genome back in 2000. Um, I haven't studied biology, so for me, having a conversation with a biologist of that level um, was fairly impressive. Um, we had incredible conversations, and I think that's probably what I get um, the, the best memories of these projects. Um, we had five Nobel laureates working with us. Um, I think Philippa Brock might be here tonight. She was working on this project. She's in hiding. <laughs> um, don't know if Rachel Kelly is here, Rachel Wingfield. Uh, but we had a few of our uh, research and designers working, uh, each with their pair, producing um, artifacts. We had to respond to uh, the bit of science the Nobel laureate um, had been awarded a Nobel for. So in the case of John, he had um, discovered some of the genes that regulate um, what is called programmed cell death or apoptosis. Um, this is uh, a principle present in every living system, so it's happened in all of you, it's happened in all of, in, in all of us. Um, and you can see on the right, so when you start with a cell which will divide into two and divide and divide but some of them will actually commit suicide, and this is healthy. And that suicidal behavior means it leaves room for another cell to grow and develop. So your fingers have been shaped because of apoptosis. The cells here have committed suicide so that the cells here could grow. So effectively, apoptosis is a sculpting mechanism. Uh, it's a means by which we can actually look at evolution, um, of cells and growth of cells as a way to make shapes. I started to look into how I can incorporate these ideas together with combining textiles and actually started working with macrame techniques, which had a sort of uh, naturally a way to mimic the behavior of DNA and self-assembly. And I had to uh, actually brace myself to tell John I was going to design poofs, uh, which was an interesting conversation. Um, what I decided to do, because John's work was very much related to uh, a model organism called C. elegans, and C. elegans is a tiny worm that lives everywhere, including in our gardens. So I decided to do a textile collection for the gardens, and these are seating furnitures that can uh, be outside, but they are designed with different range of materials, some of which will biodegrade a lot faster than others, thus revealing the final shape. 
So this was my very first attempt to incorporate biological principles into, into design. I quickly um, went into researching um, synthetic biology, actually because John mentioned synthetic biology back in 2007, when very few people talked about it and never heard about synthetic biology. But he said this is really something you need to look into if you're interested in future fabrication and future manufacture. At the time, all the papers I was reading were extremely abstract and complex. Um, but I was really interested in thinking, okay, well, could we look at synthetic biology as a means to produce future textiles uh, in a more sustainable way? And how can I translate this very abstract um, science into a design proposal? So I started by thinking about a potential roadmap. So we know in nature there is a set of genes that create this notion of weave. Um, in the middle, you see this is how we actually create a woven cloth. This is actually a, a lace I produced in collaboration with Sake Lace, a Japanese-based company. And then on the right is what I'm proposing to do with synthetic biology, looking into reprogramming plant systems uh, to generate uh, woven cloths or lace through their roots. This is because we can now code and print DNA. So in 2000, we were still at decoding genomes, but with synthetic biology, we can now actually program a genome on a computer, and we can print it with a DNA synthesizer, and we can actually boot it up in a cell, create a new organism. We can't yet do what I'm proposing to do to plants. Currently, synthetic biologists work with yeast, bacteria, algae, fairly simple organisms um, in terms of redesigning them. Currently, we can produce artemisinin, vanilla, saffron, um, and now silk um, by reprogramming yeast. So this is now really starting to shift our way to think about biology. Biology is now becoming a self-replicating self uh, living technology. Bacteria become manufacturers, proteins become tools. Um, we have now witnessed the birth of the organism industry but what kind of design or design for that industry. This also means that we can start to think differently about digital. what is digital. I mean, again, textiles is known to be the ancestor <laughs> of the computer because a very plain weave is, uh, we have a, a warp, um, we have basically one thread taken, one thread left, so it's one of one uh, in, so it's one, zero, one, zero. Uh, this is very much the recipe for a plain weave. We've gone into using this um, binary system for CAD and CAM, but now we can combine the ones and zeros with the ATCGs of the DNA code to create living organisms and living systems. That's a whole new uh, paradigm for us to start thinking in terms of designing. And to go back very quickly, I don't want to spend too long on that, but quite often people ask me, but how did you come up with these final images of the strawberry lace? So I'll show you very briefly some of the development of the work. Um, it took place over two years. A lot of it was an you know, iteration between making, reading, conversations, again making. So this iteration is very much key to my uh, process as a maker. But how can I manifest a very nascent and abstract technology that self-assembles at nanoscale? So how do I even begin to express what synthetic biology could do when you're not a biologist, when you're not working in a lab? Well, of course, the allure of the Petri dish, the spectacle of the Petri dish is very tempting. So I actually went straight to look into using the topology of a, of a science lab and worked with um, various plant systems created. These are um, spaghettis made from cucumber using molecular cooking technologies and really looking at trying to stage and create a spectacle of how can we see and witness the birth of a fabric that is um, woven. But I felt this was too predictable, too simple, and I wanted to really look into uh, the root system. There's a lot of interesting research going into synthetic biology and, and uh, morphogenesis of plant systems, which I was reading about. And I thought, well, there's something there that would be interesting. And moving away from the bark idea, but more looking into the root system, I started actually lacing with traditional lace making technique, but using strawberry and tomato roots. 
and trying to develop a vocabulary, trying to see what's possible. Of course, weaving with roots, you have to do that when they're very fresh and when they're very wet, which means they break. So I had to find tricks to be able to develop these systems. Um, I had a brilliant help from a research assistant, Amy Congdon, who actually uh, helped me make some of this because uh, I was commissioned to make a final lace doily um, for an exhibition, uh, for the Futuro Textile Exhibition. It took seven days to actually make that uh, doily, um, thanks to Amy, uh, who was very patient helping. And I then went into, so this was a lace doily, but I felt it was still too rigid. It wasn't believable enough as an actual fabric. And so I then uh, worked with photography um, and actually staging props. So this is actually a vintage lace, a painted strawberry photographed. But what I wanted was a hyper real photograph that could sort of um, signal where could we go in 50 years time with this technology. So it's really exploring the imaginary of synthetic biology. What I thought was interesting is actually I was doing this project for myself more than anything to start with because I was really curious and I was trying to understand how synthetic biology could actually help towards more sustainable uh, processes. Uh, but actually, and, and at the time, biologists were saying, oh, no, no, we're not looking into uh, textiles. Synthetic biology is looking into energy, uh, medicine. This is really where the research is going. Forget textiles. And I said, okay, so it's not really important. But then it somehow was very successful. It's still around the world. I'm not sure where it is now, but it's, it's, it's kind of in a sort of rotating show. It's been in 26 international exhibitions. And it has really sort of resonated with a lot of uh, the textile industry. And what is interesting is in 2015, this company called Ball Threads, which is based in the States, has announced the production of silk made in synthetically reprogrammed yeast. Um, and as you can see, this is the system. So we can now brew yeast and extract um, uh, the silk from the yeast and then we can then treat it as a, as a normal silk uh, material. So this is silk, silk grown by yeast. And actually this is very much what synthetic biology is going into now, looking to future materials and future textiles. This led me to think about, well, what could happen to fur? You know, could we actually look at reimagining animal-free uh, natural fur production with synthetic biology? Can we produce carotene in a lab? And this was inspired by this particular quote. Uh, some of you might not remember what floppy disks are. I think some of you are a bit too young. Uh, but this shows when this was written. Uh, so uh, Juan Henriquez is a, is a prominent biologist, again based in the States. And this is something he wrote in 2001. By reading and rewriting the gene codes of bacteria, plants, and animals, we start to turn cells, seeds, and animal embryos into the equivalent of floppy disks data sets that can be changed and rewritten to fulfill specific tasks. We start deliberately mixing and matching apples, oranges, species, plants, and animals. So we can now not only just reprogram uh, an organism, but we actually can go across the divide of our common uh, taxonomy of plant, animal. Um, that's also changing the way we think. Um, and I think for us designers, it's interesting to think about this technological emergence and trying to hack these ideas to really create what could potentially be future production systems. So here is very much a speculative uh, proposition, which is not um, the end of a project, it's really a means to the end. This was really, for me, again, a way to open up my imaginary about how else could we produce fur? Could we reprogram a mushroom to produce um, a raccoon fur, could we, produce, could we reprogram the, the Alocasia debrina, which is this plant in the middle, could that produce fur? Um, that has led me to have uh, conversations uh, with scientists to, and this is something we're working on now, looking into how can we actually program keratin in a lab. So not following these ideas, but really very much working with uh, microbes and bacteria to produce keratin. Biologizing, so another way to look into uh, moving away from speculation and how to explore the biological advantage is actually to collaborate and cooperate with a biological system. Um, I'll show you very briefly two projects I'm currently working on, they're a work in progress. 
Um, mycelium textiles is a collection of textiles um, that is really looking into how we can use mycelium to replace polymer-based coating for textiles, looking at slow-born embellishments and for fashion application. This is done using uh, mycelium, which is the root of um, um, fungus. You can see in the middle, it's a very thread-like uh, material. Um, it leaves all around us. It's actually an extraordinary organism. It connects forests together through their roots and helps uh, sh the sharing of nutrients, and it helps actually creating more resilience in forest systems. Uh, but you can actually grow it, and, and I'm not uh, an innovator in this. Uh, someone called Phil Ross has actually done a lot of work in this, where you can actually um, basically feed mycelium and to develop a whole range of materials. When a mycelium has colonized your material, you can bake it, therefore kill it, and then you're left with the material. Um, and I'm using these techniques uh, with many variations. So you can see on the left a whole range of materials which are used to provide a transformative grid that will harness and support the life of the mycelium. I'm looking at very uh, traditional textile technique like mending, coating, patterning uh, to actually uh, generate uh, a collection. So looking into this mycelium lace, looking at tartan, growing a permanent fold at ambient temperature. Um, those of you who are coming from textiles, you have heard of puff binder. Um, this is a, a polymer-based um, 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 sort of pigment that we can um, screen print over a surface of a cloth, and it has a little sort of flock feel and quality. So I'm looking at replacing the polymer-based um, puff binder with mycelium-based uh, binder. And here, again, as a designer, you, you don't learn how to work with living systems. You know, you normally work with inanimate matter, so, you know, wood or metal or uh, even cotton was alive, and it's dead by the time you get to it. So how do you actually use your design skills during the growth process? And in this case, I'm using diet. Uh, so diet control to inform the shame making and to, get, to guide the pace of colonization. So nurture staff as a design strategy. Serendipity, something that happens a lot in science and it happens a lot in design. Um, this was a very, 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 very happy accident. Um, this is a mycelium and I won't tell you too much which culture I'm using. All I will say is that it's grown on coffee. I use coffee grounds from, um, from around the college, uh, from our coffee shop here, from Caravan, um, because mycelium really likes coffee. Uh, we, we share a common <laughs> passion there. Um, and this particular one was actually a mistake. Uh, I won't tell you the, the entire protocol, but I did something at the end. It was the end of the day, and I just basically uh, placed some mycelium culture in a, coffee, uh, in a coffee container, forgot about it over three weeks. Um, I thought it had failed. It looked white on the edge, but the coffee was still all over the surface. And I thought, OK, it's not worked. I'll bake it and see. I baked it, got it out of the oven, and realized it was extremely flexible. As you can see, it behaves like a rubber. But then I washed it to wash away the leftover coffee and then discovered these floral patterns, which I have not designed. This is the mycelium using self-assembly self principles, autopoietic qualities, whatever you want to call it. But the mycelium has evolved and grown these floral patterns. As a textile designer, floral patterns is what you do. <laughs> so it's quite spooky when actually you see your mycelium doing it as well. Who is the designer? And I think when you start working with living systems and with living materials, you're starting to really challenge your, even your confidence in, in what it is to design because you have to work with cajoling, nurturing, controlling. Um, but of course, um, at the end of the day, in this case, it has a life of its own. Um, I'm currently trying to repeat this uh, so that I can patent it. <laughs> so I think that starts to pose the questions of uh, form, matter, materials, forces. Here I'll quote uh, in gold again. Um, to create anything, Aristotle reasoned, you have to bring together form, morphe, and matter, hyle. In a subsequent history of Western thought, this hylomorphic model of creation became even more deeply embedded 
but it also became increasingly unbalanced. Form came to be seen as imposed by an agent with a particular design in mind, while matter, thus rendered passive and inert, became that which was imposed upon. And actually, this really is very much how I was taught how to design. You know, you, you take some material, you impose your intention onto it, um, and then you come out with, you know, a textile or an artifact. But I think when you work with living organisms, this means you have to incorporate the active and dynamic qualities of matter. Matter is not rendered victim of a shape-forming activity, but actually it becomes the enabler of the morphogenetic process. And I think that's a quite a shift in terms of thinking about design. So with Gromit textiles, the hierarchy between matter and form is transformed into a symbiotic and evolving relationship. And I think what we're after there is a relationship between material and forces, as opposed to matter and form. This also means that I need to understand what I grow, because I cannot grow it otherwise. But equally, um, if I cannot grow something, that means I cannot understand it. This collaboration with natural system is something I'm using in this other project called Botanical Craft. So with mycelium textiles, I'm looking at now developing um, accessories and collars and buttons for fashion, uh, using the current material archive to inform the, the production of final artifacts. Botanical craft uh, is again a, another slow project. It's looking at revisiting very traditional craft that you find in China in the Qing dynasty in the 18th century. Um, the idea here is that you grow, uh, these are gourds, and you can grow them with a mold in place. Uh, the gourd will very slowly fill in the mold, and then you can harvest it, and then you can dry it. And when it's dried, the, the flesh inside totally dries out, and the outer skin becomes uh, like a wood, like a soft wood. Uh, it's used in Africa uh, to contain water, it's used in, ma in, ma in many countries. But I think what's interesting here is perhaps to revisit this in relation to how can we grow a product? What kind of geometries can we control? And can we talk about slow horticulturing as opposed to rapid manufacturing? So this process takes nearly 12 months between seeding, growing the plants, harvesting, letting them dry naturally. Um, so it takes a year to grow a container. Would we consider that container differently if we have grown it over 12 months? So I'm looking at developing this technique uh, to produce a final collection which should be showcased here in November. We have an exhibition in the Lethaby Gallery that hopefully you'll come and see. So we're looking at, I've been looking at biologizing, speculating, collaborating with nature. And I really felt that I needed to create a, a framework uh, for me to operate within. Um, and really looking into how we can navigate the handmade to the man-made and the man and the grow made. As a designer, it's really shifting our processes and our protocols. So I came up with this uh, framework, which I used um, in the curation of an exhibition in Paris, which is very much looking into shifting and the ability from in, in, in this new context to shift from looking to biomimicry principles and looking at imitating nature's behavior, patterns, to collaborating with nature, to hack nature, and this is when we involve synthetic biology. This informed the curation of Alive, presented in Paris in 2013, uh, but slightly with a slightly derived model. Um, and I won't present you um, the entire concept of this exhibition, it would take an hour in itself. Uh, but what was really interesting here is to really look at shaping uh, a biodesign exhibition that uh, looked at sustainability as a filter to select and curate um, the propositions. From Philip Beasley with Radiant Soul, who's looking at imitating the metabolism of cells and structures, um, all the way to gardening uh, with Ecologic Studio, looking at actually creating algae gardens, uh, to developing, and this was a commission uh, for Suzanne Lee and uh, Lise Chocaccio Squire. They produced the very first shoe grown by bacteria using um, harvesting bacterial cellulose produced by bacteria. 
Um, this exhibition was really looking into, so you see Phil Ross as well, the Yamaka furniture, which is here. So Phil Ross is one of the pioneers in working with mycelium. Tomasz Libertini collaborating with 60,000 bees to make a vase. All the way to Vincent Fournier looking into uh, speculating into future species redesigned for climate change. To Natsak Chisa looking into dyeing textiles with uh, bacteria and again diet control of bacteria so that they express various colors. All the way to um, the biological atelier with Amy Condon who is now one of our PhD students. Looking into protocell shoes, protocell architecture and ending the exhibition with a very, very provocative uh, proposition, which is Arne Hendricks um, researching, um, this is a project called The Incredible Shrinking Man. He's proposing that to better fit our planet in terms of sustainability, we should be shrunk. And you can see on the side, you can see the little people on the side, that's the size he would like us to be. Um, if we were that size, one chicken would feed 100 of us. Um, so he's using his very radical provocation to try and bring alight some issues of sustainabilities. Road mapping. So we're looking at you know, various techniques. This is how a chair was in the 19th century, 20th century, and Eric Clar Clarenbeck producing a mycelium 3D printed chair. Uh, so we're moving and shifting between forming, molding and growing. Where I think it becomes interesting in terms of designing for the bioeconomy is when you start looking into comparing biodesign with conventional design, linear conventional economy with a biocircular economy. We are mostly in that quarter right now, and the 20th century was very much about that. We are transitioning towards slowly the biocircular economy and looking into more biodesign where biology and design work together. Uh, to develop new um, production processes. But where I want to be is here. Where I think we should be looking at is exploiting the biological advantage for a fully biocircular economy. A lot of work to do there still, but we need to shift how we practice design, how we teach design, how we learn about design. This can only happen when we collaborate. So the Medical Research Council has been a brilliant collaborator, 10 years of collaboration. The Nobel Textiles was one, but we had loads of other projects and a series of what we call Fabrics of Life workshops, uh, where we bring in scientists in the curriculum, we develop projects with them, and we usually actually inform the scientists so, so much so that when they go back to their labs, they have changed their own research questions. The Craft Council was very much, uh, the Bio Salon was looking into creating conversations, time for conversations, because if we're shifting the way we work, we need to talk to biologists. Where does that happen? How does that happen? Um, this was uh, an EU funded project uh, called the Resilience, uh, looking into um, working across biomimicry using two plant systems, uh, looking at aronia and flax. And this was very much based on the research uh, of uh, Bartaku. Bartaku is a Flemish-based um, artist who has developed uh, the very first um, recipe to make edible solar cells. Uh, he calls them photo, photoelectric uh, foof, he calls them, it's a Flemish name. Um, and we developed uh, a Pero lab. We looked into how can we actually try and replicate what an aronia berry would do in terms of actually taking the sun energy to create starch and sugar for the plants. So we um, developed a whole range of recipes uh, that is only using edible um, materials. I won't tell you what we're injecting there. It is edible. Um, and we created this Apero Lab, really looking into helping people to understand actually how do we create energy using only edible materials and using aronia dyes. Um, it is edible, not necessarily tasty. Um, but this was a really interesting project where our students really learned, in, in t <laughs> we learned about actually uh, solar cycles, um, interactive design, and in terms of research, we really pushed both what could be done with aronia and flax. 
I have to mention this because um, the final summit was actually last two weeks ago now in New York. Uh, this year, our uh, Material Futures Masters students, first year, together with uh, material, uh, MA Art Science, this is the first time MA Material Futures and MA Art Science collaborate together. We uh, entered a competition called the Biodesign Challenge and we chose the topic of the Anthropocene. Um, and the collaborations there were brilliant, again working with uh, Heather Barnett, with MA Art Science, working with Dr. Tom Ellis that you can see here, who is a um, um, synthetic biologist based at Imperial College, who runs the Tom Ellis Lab. Um, we had, uh, he actually here is doing something very, where is he? He's somewhere over there. He's doing something very cool. He's decoding uh, the microbe, the bacteria, sorry, the bacteria that they are using for bacterial cellulose research using a portable um, gene decoding machine. And this was the first time they were doing it and they came to do it live with us, with our students. So we decoded the entire genome of that bacteria live in our studio upstairs. These collaborations are crucial because it's how we redefine what we do and how we make. And uh, the winning team, because of course we won, um, at MoMA in New York last week, um, Nina Cutler and Liv Bargman did an absolute uh, stunning job, fabulous presentation of their project called Quantum Mine. This project really takes into account how we can repurpose abandoned Welsh mine using earthworms, which naturally earthworms can produce quantum dots, and quantum dots actually use uh, currently, you'll find some TV screens that use quantum dots, but they're produced synthetically. Earthworms produce these quantum dots when they eat toxic soil. So the proposition here is to actually place these earthworm in this abandoned Welsh mine um, with our very fabulous new Welsh miner um, using uh, worm charming techniques and worm zapping techniques um, hybridizing our English earthworm with an Australian giant one so that we actually optimize the production. And the idea here is to really produce the new energy. So coal mining becomes quantum dot, quantum dot mining because of a earthworm um, farm, basically. Um, but at the same time, that would decontaminate the mines. So what I'm really trying to propose here tonight, and hopefully convince some of you, is that we really need to recalibrate design for the bioeconomy. And how do we do that? We need to grow new tools, new protocols. We need to integrate biology in a design curriculum, but we need to integrate design in the biology curriculum. We can still take into account all these different uh, aspects, you know, problem solving, problem framing, critical discourse, uh, speculation, biodesign can actually lead on, e on each of these. Um, and we really need to start to pioneer a whole range of uh, new designers. Um, and I want to show you one now, which I think is spectacular. Um, this is Dr. Jane Scott, who uh, completed her PhD last year with us, uh, who did an incredible project researching how can we design knitted responsive um, textiles, 100% natural, but that can be responsive and behave like smart textiles. And you can see in the film here, the fabric is slowly moving. It is 100% natural. There is no battery, there's no shape memory films, there's no polymers whatsoever, there's no electronics whatsoever. It's simply in a very, very clever use of the kinds of yarns she's using, the knitting uh, system she's using. Um, what you're not seeing here is that this is designed to respond to changing humidity levels. And so she's actually spraying the fabric. And this is real time, it's not sped up. But you can see how the fabric actually can contract and she can control different shapes. Um, and this is really what is the new smart. This is the biomimetic smart, where actually there's no need for electricity, energy. This is 100% natural fibers, biodegradable renewable. So I've talked about how we need to observe, translate, speculate, biologize, framework, roadmap, collaborate, recalibrate so that we can pioneer uh, in the field of the new bioeconomy. What I think is crucial for us is to think about 
how what is perceived to be natural has become a blurred and shifting definition. We need to change a set of hierarchies of how we design with nature, how we reference nature. That might take us back to horticulture. That might take us all the way to working into a lab with synthetic biologists. We need to really incorporate ethical issues into this. You know, how far do we want to go into working with living systems? How do we control them or not control them? But really what I would like us to uh, think about tonight and what I would like you to go away with tonight is the idea that we need to create a new bar of modernity that is inclusive, interconnected and, mi and mindful. And I'll leave you with this quote. Again, thank you to our fabulous first year material futures and art science students. Um, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think that's where biodesign can do. That's what design for the bioeconomy can do. I would like to thank, first of all, all the students that I have been uh, working with for what they've taught me. All my colleagues who are usually extremely patient in dealing with my very weird ideas. Uh, collaborators who reminded me and to Sandra St. Martins for an ever supportive, um, continuing um, support here. And a lot of people have been involved, uh, a lot of IT wizards have been involved in the setup today and in the past four days. So thank you to all who have had uh, contributing towards this evening. Mm -hmm.